So welcome to our online seminar. We're very happy to have so many people here today. And I showed the um, lineup we have for the next four weeks. Sean Cooey will talk next week. Elizabeth Kwasan, Matt Hastings about his exciting new result, and then Cheng Wei Lu. Today, we're really happy to have Scott Aronson. Scott is known for his wonderful work on complexity and he founded the Complexity Zoo Wiki. He was at MIT until 2016 when he left to go to Austin, where he's director of the UT Center for Quantum Information and really needs no other introduction. So Scott, turn it over to you. Okay, well, well thanks so much. Now let's see, how do I uh, get the whiteboard now? You share your screen. All right. So I share the screen. Oh, I, okay. And now whiteboard. All right. Oh, that was easy. All right. Let's try this. Yeah. So this talk is called From Archimedes to Quantum Supremacy. Uh, and uh, um, I'm really grateful to uh, uh, Arthur for inviting me, uh, you know, to a mathematical picture language seminar, despite the fact that this talk uh, will not have uh, any picture language in it. Uh, it will have pictures and it will have language. Uh, but um, um, this talk uh, uh, is going to be extremely informal. Uh, so, you know, feel free to interrupt and ask me questions. Um, to be perfectly honest, uh, I've found it really hard to concentrate on quantum computing uh, these past few months, uh, or really anything besides, you know, my kids and what feels like the uh, impending collapse of civilization um, uh, that, that, that's happening all around us. But it's, it's very good for my mental health to be forced to think about quantum computing from time to time. So, so thank you for that. Okay, so uh, the story that I want to tell today, um, you can see, you know, starts with uh, Archimedes uh, at about 200 BC, and uh, it uh, uh, continues on to uh, Google's uh, quantum supremacy experiment uh, that they announced uh, just last year. Okay, so um, Archimedes, uh, as many of you uh, uh, probably know, uh, is the one who first uh, worked out the surface area uh, of a sphere. That's my sphere. Uh, in particular, that it's uh, uh, that the surface area is four pi r squared, right? And the way that he did that was uh, extremely interesting. Uh, he did it by showing uh, that if I take a cylinder that just perfectly circumscribes the sphere, uh, uh, and I, I, I don't count the top or the bottom, so I only count kind of the the, the part that goes around. Uh, the cylinder part, then, then that has exactly the same surface area as the sphere that it encloses. Okay, and you know the surface area of the cylinder is very easily calculated to be uh, you know two r times two pi r, so, so four pi r squared. Um, and and the way he showed that is is again interesting. You know, and and you know keep in mind he didn't have calculus, so you know he had to do everything conceptually. Uh, uh, as it were, the, the way he did it was by uh, slicing this up, uh, let's say, you know, uh, just chopping up the cylinder uh, into a bunch of uh, very thin slices, okay, uh, 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 horizontal slices. And then he said that within each slice, uh, the, the um, area of the cylinder within that slice is equal to uh, the surface area of the sphere that is within that slice. So that is true on a slice by slice basis. And when I say equal, what I really mean is approximately equal, you know, but with the approximation getting better and better as the, uh, the height of the slices goes to zero. Okay. And, 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 and how did he show this? This is, by the way, called the Archimedes hat box theorem. I think it was, you know, one of the more non trivial things uh, that was proved in antiquity uh, at all. Okay, and uh, the way that he uh, uh, proved it was by uh, saying, okay, well, look, you know, it, it's pretty 
clear that in the middle, you know, the uh, uh, this is true, right? Uh, that you know we have, you know, the, the cylinder goes all the way around, like you know, two pi r. The uh, uh, sphere also goes all the way around. Okay, but then as you go toward the north or the south pole of the sphere, um, as you go toward the poles, uh, there are two things that happen with the sphere. Uh, the first thing that happens is, of course, that the, uh, um, the, the, the radius, the way around, gets smaller and smaller. But the second thing that happens is that, uh, you know, it gets more and more curved inwards. So the first force is sort of decreasing the uh, uh, area of each annular section. But the second force is increasing the, the area of each annular section, right? And Archimedes gave a, you know, a very nice geometric argument that those two forces actually precisely cancel each other out. Okay, so, the, the, so as you go up the sphere, you know, with uh, uh, annular sections of constant height, uh, the area uh, of those sections stays basically constant. Okay. Uh, um, and, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little, you know, embarrassing to, you know, uh, talk about such, such ancient things in a, in, a, in a Harvard math seminar, but, you know, I, I did want to have pictures in the talk. Okay, so, uh, um, uh, so, so, that, so that was uh, um, um, Archimedes' uh, hat box theorem. Now, uh, uh, you know, it, it works, it, you know, beautifully this way for, you know, S2, in other words, for a three-dimensional sphere, it doesn't work out quite as beautifully in, in other numbers of dimensions, okay? But, you know, in, in this number of dimensions, you know, you, you have something kind of magical happen, right, that the two forces exactly cancel each other out. Uh, the sort of shrinking of the radius of the annular sections and sort of the, the growth of uh, the sort of, uh, uh, I guess, a, a, thickness of the onion ring as they get curved more and more diagonally inward. Okay, uh, so what does any of this have to do with, with quantum mechanics at all, you know, let alone with, with quantum supremacy? All right, well, this brings me to, um, I save this? Okay, now let's uh, uh, clear. Um, this, this, this brings me, to a, a beautiful observation by the physicist Bill Waters uh, in the 19, I think the early 1980s. Okay, and uh, Waters said the following. He said, uh, suppose that we pick just a, a random unit vector in C to the D. Okay, so uh, I'll just say V is a random unit vector in, in C to the D. Okay, and uh, so it has D complex entries like that. Uh, okay, and then he said, well, uh, uh, any, any unit vector like this will give rise to a probability distribution as follows, you know, by uh, the Born rule. Okay, uh, it will give rise to, uh, uh, you know, a non-negative vector, uh, which will be a, a vector of probability. So let's call that uh, P1 up to P to the D. Okay, uh, and, and he asked the question, well, if um, V is chosen uniformly at random from, you know, the D-dimensional uh, complex unit sphere, then what is this probability vector going to look like? What will be the statistics of this vector? Let's give this vector a name. Let's just call it D or something. Okay, and um, he made a, a beautiful observation, uh, which was the following, that if uh, um, uh, uh, V, you know, is indeed, you know, har random, so it was uniform on the unit sphere, then the induced probability distribution, uh, D, will be uniform on the probability synthesis, okay? So a, a random unit vector, when we take the absolute squares of each of its entries, uh, gives rise to just a, a random probability distribution, you know, a random point on the, uh, uh, on, on the d-dimensional simplex, okay? 
And um, this is, uh, so let me, uh, uh, so, so um, um, let's say, or to restate this in more uh, quantum mechanics terms, I could simply say, if I have a Haar random uh, quantum state uh, psi in C to the D, and then I look at the vector, uh, uh, this one, Uh, then this vector will be uniformly random on uh, on the simplex of all uh, possible probability distributions over over G elements. Okay, and um, uh, where where one to D is just any uh, uh, orthonormal basis. Okay, and and th this this is only true uh, uh, if uh, you know uh, uh, quantum mechanics is over the complex sum. Okay, it relies on uh, the complex nature of amplitudes in, in quantum mechanics. Uh, if amplitudes were real, uh, then um, you know this wouldn't work. And if amplitudes were quaternion were, were quaternionic, then then it again wouldn't work. Okay, but with complex numbers, there's a sort of Goldilocks effect where where this just works uh, perfectly. Okay, and um, why does it happen? Well, you know, I'll, let me let me just uh, rather than giving you uh, like a full proof of this, let me just give you sort of the elements of a proof, you know, by which uh, a, a proof could be could be constructed. Um, okay, uh, so um, so the so the so the basic idea uh, is each um, amplitude, you know, when when I take a, a, a random uh, d-dimensional state, uh, then each, uh, um, and I look at uh, all d of its amplitudes, then uh, each one uh, looks a lot like a, a just a complex uh, 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 Gaussian. So in other words, each amplitude, let me just draw another picture, uh, is, is going to look like a uh, Gaussian uh, centered at zero, you know, where you know the real and the imaginary parts are are, are independent Gaussians, okay, and and the uh, uh, variance is like you know what one over root d, right? So uh, uh, and 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 um, why is that? Well, I mean, one way to see why that has to be true is that you know if you wanted to program your computer to choose a random uh, unit vector, a random point on a d-dimensional sphere. Well, you know, a famous way to do that is to just pick the independent Gaussians and then normalize the results, right? And, you know, this has to give you a random point on the sphere because of the rotational invariance of the Gaussian measure, right? And, uh, 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 so, so, we, so we know that it works. And, you know, when d is large, we have a concentration of measure Right, the, uh, the 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 total norm of the vector doesn't vary a whole lot anyway, and so as d gets larger and larger, each of these entries is more and more closely approximated by just you know a Gaussian. Okay, um, and and now the uh, the so so that, so that so that's the first thing to say, and the second thing to say is that uh, if I take a complex Gaussian, so I, you know, I take a, a, a you know, like a, a sample from this distribution where the, the real and the imaginary parts are both uh, independent Gaussians uh, uh, centered at zero, and now I, I look at its squared magnitude. So I look at uh, well this, you know, the squared absolute value of the result. Then what I'm going to get is precisely an exponentially distributed random variable. Okay. So uh, um, let me uh, just say that again. Um, um, let's say if alpha is a complex Gaussian, mean zero and variance one, then absolute value of, of uh, alpha squared will be exponentially distributed. So it'll look like that. Okay, uh, uh, and um, yeah, 
of, uh, of uh, you know, just an exponential variable of mean one. Okay, so um, you know, and 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 uh, um, you know, a way to uh, see that. Well, you know, if 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 I want to choose a uniformly random point on the probability simplex, uh, you know, if I wanted to program my computer to do that, a famous way to do that is to just choose the uh, independent exponentially distributed random variables and then normalize the results right and uh, this will this will work uh, this, you know because uh, uh, well you know when, when, when I think about the probabilities you know e to the minus x1 times e to the minus x2 and so forth I just get e to the minus uh, the sum right and uh, so um, um, uh, so you know from the fact that each uh, 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 um, Gaussian individually, when I take its squared absolute value, I get an exponential random variable. You know, I can then deduce that if I take a random point on the uh, unit sphere and I take all of the squared absolute values, then I get a random, prob a uniformly random probability distribution. Right? I can deduce uh, Wooders' theorem uh, uh, from that. Okay. So then finally, why is it that if I take a uh, a complex Gaussian centered at zero, and then I look at its squared absolute value, that that is an exponential uh, random variable, you know, in the, uh, e to the minus x or whatever. Well, you know, one, one way uh, to see that would just be to, you know, you solve the calculus problem. You know, it's, it's, a, it's an easy enough calculation to do, right? Uh, a more conceptual way uh, of seeing it is that if I look at, uh, the, um, I look at a comp, like, uh, let's say, a complex Gaussian space. So here's, you know, the complex plane. Here's a, a Gaussian a random variable. Uh, you know, and now I look at some concentric circles. Uh, now, um, you know, I, uh, you know, of course, it's the, you know, the squared distance to one of these rings, one of these annular rings, that is telling me. Uh, uh, the uh, the probability value, the value that I get over here. Okay, and and now if I think about what distribution over these probabilities, you know, is induced by you know sampling a Gaussian point and then taking its squared absolute value. Well, there are sort of two opposing forces in play. Okay, the first force is that uh, 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 because this is a, a, a the complex plane, you know, the rings become larger and larger in circumference. Right, that that's obvious. The, you know, the further I go out, the, the circumference scales. You know, like get two pi times the radius. But then a second thing that happens is that in order to look at, uh, you know, because I'm squaring, uh, you know, in order to look at sort of the uh, uh, um, what, what do you call it, the the, the uh, level sets, or you know, these sort of uh, lines of sort of constant probability mass. Rather, I have to look at thinner and thinner rings. Right. I have to, because of the squaring, I have to look at thinner and thinner uh, annular rings the further I go out. Okay, and those two forces precisely cancel each other out once again. Okay, so we retain the same uh, area of the an of the annular ring the further we go out. Um, and uh, um, and 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 this is why I just get you know uh, uh, in the exponent here just x. You know, and, and and there's no correction term here. Okay, uh, so again, as uh, as I said, with uh, uh, real amplitudes, this wouldn't work out so nicely. With quaternionic amplitudes, it also wouldn't work out so nicely. Uh, but with uh, complex amplitudes, the two opposed forces sort of cancel, and uh, and I just get a, a, an exactly uh, a exponential random variable. Okay, so. Uh, uh, you know, this is this is one of several phenomena that have been put forward to sort of explain, quote unquote, why uh, you know if, if you were designing quantum mechanics from scratch, you might want it to have uh, uh, complex amplitudes in the first place, right? Uh, you know, a, 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 a large fraction of everything we do in quantum information would work just as well with real amplitudes. Uh, so, you know, uh, uh, for example, quantum computation would have exactly the same power uh, in, in, a, in a world with quantum mechanics over R. Uh, 
but you know a few things would just uh, uh, not work out as nicely. Uh, you know, of course, once you go to actual physics, you see how quantum mechanics is implemented in the real world. Well, then complex numbers are used all over the place, and you couldn't take them out without you know messing up the whole structure. But you know, at the abstract information theory theory level, you could ask, you know, uh, did did quantum mechanics really have to use complex numbers? And in some sense, it didn't. But you know, this is one of the things that works out a lot more nicely if it does. Okay. So um, uh, now, now you know, a, 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 a particularly nice way to get some intuition for what is going on here uh, with Waters' theorem is to look at the special case of a qubit. So uh, the, the 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 special case d equals two, right? Uh, and uh, and of course the possible states of a qubit can be represented on uh, the block here. Okay, you know I promised pictures, so here's another picture. Uh, uh, the block sphere is just the representation where I put say the zero state over here. I put the one state on the opposite end. So you know or orthogonality now means uh, uh, putting the uh, putting on the opposite side. I put the plus state on top. I put the uh, minus state on the bottom, zero plus one and zero minus one. And then um, in the third dimension, I'll have the I state, meaning zero plus I one, and I'll have the minus I state, meaning zero minus I one. Okay, um, so uh, um, this is uh, uh, the, the um, Bloch sphere. And uh, you might know that uh, if I measure uh, uh, like uh, if, if, I, if I take a point on the uh, uh, so so a, a, a one qubit state uh, you know a, a point on the block sphere and I measure in let's say the zero one basis then the probability that I see zero uh, is given by just exactly how far I am along this line right here okay so you know if I'm right in the middle I have a half probability of seeing zero and um, uh, you know, if I'm all the way over here, of course, I'll definitely see zero and so on. So there's a there's a one to one mapping, you know, I just map from this sphere uh, to this line. Uh, the nice thing about the block sphere is it sort of automatically takes care of the squaring. Part, so I don't have to deal with that anymore. Okay, but now uh, we can ask the question about the block sphere. Uh, well, suppose that I uh, chose a uniformly random point uh, on the sphere then what distribution over distributions over zero and one would that give rise to, right? So I take a, a random state of one qubit. I now measure it in the zero one basis. I look at what distribution that gives rise to, you know, and now I ask, well, what, what is the distribution over distribution? Okay, and the claim is that that is precisely the uniform distribution over distribution. In other words, if I take a Haar random state and then I look at the probability uh, of seeing one, or in other words, if I look at the overlap between psi and the one state, the, the absolute square of the overlap, then you know, when I call that P, then P will just be uniformly distributed uh, in uh, the unit interval. Okay, so, and, and you might, uh, if you've been paying attention, you might notice that this fact is precisely Archimedes theorem. Okay, so it's not just analogous to it, it is Archimedes theorem. Okay, it's just the, the statement that if I cut uh, uh, a sphere, if I take a sphere in three dimensions and I cut it up into a bunch of thin slices, then each of these thin slices has the same surface area. Okay, so, uh, uh, so, so, so we see the relationship between uh, uh, the Archimedes hat box theorem and, and Wooders' theorem. Okay, and once again, uh, we can see uh, we can see that this would not work if we, you know, uh, if amplitudes were real, right? If amplitudes were real, then we would uh, be working only in two dimensions instead of in three. And then, you know, if I take a random point, let's say on the unit circle, and then I try to project it onto this line, well, I'm going to find that my distribution is more bunched up at the edges. Okay, because you know there's just more stuff over here, right? Uh, and it's going to be thinner in the middle. 
peso, it's not going to work out. Only with uh, uh, the sphere, you know, which I got from complex amplitudes, does it does it work out perfectly? So I get the uniform distribution over here. Okay, so that was um, a, a a sort of you know, I mean, I, I couldn't resist telling you about it, right? But that was sort of a you know a long-winded way to get to a a conceptual point uh, that is extremely important. Uh, in uh, uh, the analysis of quantum supremacy experiments, okay, like like the one that uh, uh, famously uh, uh, Google did uh, uh, just uh, uh, this past summer, okay. Now, um, uh, and 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 it's the following. Um, so, let's say that I imagine a now a Haar random n qubit state. Okay, so this is now a random uniformly random unit vector in C to the two to the N, okay? In a, you know, the nice uh, high dimensional vector space that we like uh, in quantum computation. Uh, then, um, uh, you know, and, and, and why do we care about this? Well, basically because this is a, an approximate model for the kind of state that you would end up with if you just did a random quantum computation for a long time. Okay, so in other words, let's imagine that I have a quantum computer that consists of n qubits. Okay, so uh, the state of the quantum computation, you know, is just a, a vector in C to the two to the n. Initially, let's say it's the all zeros vector, you know, some computational basis state. Uh, and then uh, I apply a sequence of gates. Uh, to um, uh, transform my vector. Uh, so let's say two qubit gates, you know, they might be a nearest neighbor in some, you know, 1D or 2D architecture, or, or they might not be. Okay, I just apply a whole bunch of uh, 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 unitary operations that act on one or two of the qubits at a time, you know, and, and I, choose these ran I, I choose the unitary operations ra uh, randomly, okay? Well then, uh, one can show um, without too much trouble that if I continued this for long enough, in particular, if I continued it for like two to the n time, for uh, you know an exponentially long time, then uh, I will end up with uh, a, a close to Haar random quantum state, you know, as I range over all the possible quantum circuits that I could have applied. Okay. Now, uh, of course, in practice, we don't have time to apply an exponential number of gates. Okay, no one, no one uh, ever, apply, you know, can, can apply two to the n gates, even with a, a an ideal quantum computer. You know, and and uh, uh, so so all, all the more with this sort of uh, limited and noisy device that Google has now. Okay, but even if I only apply a polynomial number of gates, like n n to some power. Uh, we might expect that uh, we we get a uh, a distribution over states that will behave like the Haar random distribution in many relevant respects. Um, now, you know, to be clear, it it can't be the Haar distribution. Why not? Well, because just by accounting argument, we don't have nearly enough degrees of freedom, right? Uh, uh, you know, the Haar distribution would involve two to the n more or less independent amplitudes. You know, I'm not going to get that many degrees of freedom by just applying uh, uh, n to the order of one uh, random gates. Okay, but uh, what I'll get is uh, a, a an ensemble of states, a distribution over states, where um, at least if I look at a small number of amplitudes in isolation, so let's say I get an output state psi, and now if I look at uh, the inner product with psi and x for any given computational basis state x of my choice, so any like x for any some x and 0, 1 to the n, uh, uh, I will find that, that this, this inner product uh, looks like uh, a Gaussian centered at 0, like a complex Gaussian centered at 0. Okay, and if I look at any small number of them, uh, they will look like independent complex Gaussians uh, centered at 0. Okay, now that, that statement, the thing that I just said, um, uh, things close to that can now be rigorously proven in various special cases. Uh, 
there uh, was a, a paper by, um, um, by Aram Harrow and um, by um, 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 uh, 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 Harrow and, and Lowe and um, um, uh, Fernando Brando. Um, I believe uh, there was a, uh, there was a recent paper uh, that proved a, a stronger result by Aram Harrow and uh, my former PhD student Saeed Maraban. Uh, the rigorous results that have been proved about sort of convergence to the uh, uh, um, the sort of har random like behavior uh, are not quite as 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 tight as we would like them to be. Uh, but even in the cases where, where they're not rigorously proved, well, you know, I, I, I could, uh, at the risk of offending um, some of the mathematicians, I could say that we know them to be true by way of MATLAB. Uh, you know, we can, we can do this numerical simulation and see that it's true. And, uh, you know, and, and sort of, you know, we have excellent heuristic grounds to uh, uh, expect it to be true. Uh, but but uh, uh, more, more to the point, uh, in order, you know, to analyze the quantum supremacy experiments, I won't actually need a sort of rigorous proof that these um, uh, uh, amplitudes behave uh, like, you know, uh, like like IID Gaussians. It will be enough to do the experiment and then observe that we do get the behavior, you know, in, in question. You know, it, you know that like like that that statement goes into uh, the statement that yes, we can succeed, we can pass this, you know, when we, we, when we build the quantum computer, we will be able to pass this test that will apply with a high probability. So, you know, it might be nice to have some assurance on that point, but ultimately the way to verify it is to actually do the experiment and then see that you do pass the test with a high probability, right? The part where you really need a, a rigorous analysis and where you can't uh, skimp on that is uh, for sort of the other side, where you're trying to argue that there is not a fast classical algorithm that would do the same thing, okay? And uh, and 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 this sort of probabilistic analysis is not needed for that part. Okay, so let me uh, just uh, uh, say uh, 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 where we've gotten. So uh, so 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 what so what I've said sort of leads to a picture where if we were to take you know, a collection of n qubits, uh, and then apply to those qubits uh, a randomly chosen sequence of gates. And, you know, it will have to be of a high enough depth, uh, this, this sequence of gates, enough for sort of scrambling to happen. Uh, um, but uh, uh, let, let's say that I apply a, uh, you know, a deep enough, but still a polynomial sized uh, a random sequence of gates then what I should end up with is uh, an output vector, psi, which is now uh, a vector consisting of two to the n amplitudes. Okay? So uh, there are, uh, uh, so, 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 so this I expect to be my final state of my quantum computation, this vector of two to the n amplitudes. And now, crucially, I expect uh, uh, each of these amplitudes to kind of act like an IID Gaussian, which means that its absolute square uh, will act like uh, an exponential random variable, right? Which means that if I now look at the probability distribution over n bit strings that I would get by measuring my system, so, so that distribution, then this just looks like a random distribution, which as we said, means that each of the probabilities is exponentially distributed, okay? And, you know, I'm, I'm harping on this point because, you know, when people hear about uh, the quantum supremacy experiments, like the one that Google did based on random circuit sampling, you know, usually their first objection is, well, it sounds like you're just sampling a bunch of completely random garbage, right? What's the point, right? Uh, you know, if I just wanted a random n-bit string, I could have sampled one myself. I don't need a quantum computer to do that, right? That's an easy problem. Okay, but the point is, um, this is uh, uh, um, this is very specific garbage. Okay, it's 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 garbage, but it's not uniform. Okay, because uh, each of these probabilities, 
So let's say that uh, I, I define P sub X to be the squared absolute value of the uh, amplitude of X. Then each of these probabilities, P sub X, uh, will typically be exponentially small. You know, will typically be of order two to the minus N. Right, which means that this is an experiment where I could run it, you know, from now until, you know, uh, uh, the end of the millennium. And I probably, you know, would never expect the same outcome to appear twice. Okay, right? I'll get a different string, a different X each time I run the experiment because they all have exponentially small probabilities. Okay, but crucially, these probabilities are not exactly two to the minus N. Uh, so it might be that uh, one, you know, one of them is uh, uh, a little bit larger than two to the minus n. Uh, the next one is a little bit smaller than, than two to the minus n, and so on. Uh, they will vary by, uh, uh, well, you know, the, you know each, each of these is just an exponential random variable of, of mean one, okay? So, you know, so, so they will fluctuate. Some outcomes we expect to be a little bit likelier than others. And if we knew the quantum circuit that was being applied, and if we had enough computational power, then we could even predict which outcomes are likelier to occur than which other ones. Okay, uh, now, now notice that this is very different from what would happen if I had a classical random process and I just let that evolve. Like I just took a Markov chain, for example. If I, had, if I had a classical Markov chain, then I expect, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, I, I, I expect it to typically, you know, rather rapidly uh, uh, converge to a stationary distribution. Uh, you know, if, if I just took like a random sequence of probabilistic gates, then uh, we could say, you know, I, I will very rapidly uh, converge to the uniform distribution over zero, one to the n you know, over all the n bit strings. And so then that is not interesting, right? That, you know, because uh, in order to see sort of a signature of solving a hard computational problem, I'm going to need deviations from uniformity, right? But uh, this, this behavior uh, that I talked about, this uh, sort of uh, 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 Wooter's uh, 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 behavior of, uh, you know, a, getting a random point on the probability simplex, is telling me that I'm not just getting the uniform distribution. Okay, I'm getting these constant or you know constant over two to the n sized uh, deviations from uniformity, uh, which I then have some hope of detecting after I run the experiment. Okay, and specifically, what I can do uh, in order to try to verify quantum supremacy is that I can run the experiment. So let's say I, I pick. I pick a random uh, quantum circuit, C, from my ensemble of random circuits. I then run C a bunch of times, let's say each time on the all zero initial state, and then each time I measure the final state, I measure each of the qubits in the zero one basis, in the computational basis, right? So each time I do that, that gives me a sample from some you know, output distribution. Uh, um, let's call it distribution D sub C, right? That's just the, the distribution uh, consisting of, you know, where, where the probability of X is the squared absolute value of the amplitude of X. Uh, and um, so I can run my computation a bunch, let's say K times, in order to get K independent samples from this distribution, right? Each of which will be an N bit string, okay? So this is now the sort of output of my quantum supremacy experiment. Okay, now the question is, well, what can I do with a classical computer in order to check whether these outputs actually solve a computational problem that would have been hard for a classical computer to solve? Okay, now, uh, you know, now uh, uh, intuitively what I wanna do is a statistical test on these samples that will check you know, are they preferentially clustered among the, uh, the output strings that were supposed to be a little bit more likely to appear? Like, you know, twice as likely or three times as likely as the other one. Um, uh, so there are many different statistical tests that could do that job. Uh, the one that Google uh, uh, ended up using 
uh, was something called uh, linear cross entropy or linear XEB. Okay, and that was simply uh, the following. Uh, one of the simplest things you could write down. Uh, all I do is I, using my classical computer and using a lot of computation time, I calculate the predicted pr probabilities for each of the uh, measurement outcomes that I observe. Okay, so I say, you know, if I had a noiseless, perfect quantum computer, then what would be the probability that it would sample S1, right? That's that's this number here, it's the absolute square of that transition amplitude. So, you know, if I've got two to the n time with my classical computer, I can calculate that, right? Then what would be the probability uh, of the string S2 and so forth? And then I sum all of those probabilities up, okay? And I'm, go and I'm gonna declare the test to be a success if and only if this sum exceeds some threshold that, that, that I'll have to set. Okay. So, uh, so it's a very, very simple thresholding test. Uh, it's called cross entropy for historical reasons. It's not actually an entropy. Okay. But uh, um, let me uh, uh, um, let me say, you know, I mean, what what value should we expect for that sum? Let me just write it again. Okay, so oops, uh, this is the sum of the, uh, uh, the ideal probabilities for each of the K output strings that we observed in, you know, when we ran our quantum computer, uh, you know, which we can calculate with using, you know, like exponential time with our classical computer. Now, um, what we're going to do is we're going to say that our test accepts if and only if this sum exceeds a threshold, which will have the form b times k over 2 to the n, where b is going to be some constant, uh, some number between 1 and 2. Okay, so now what is going on here? Let me give you some intuition. Well, suppose in the first place that I just threw away my quantum computer and I just picked a bunch of strings S sub i uh, classically, you know, just uniformly at random. Well, then, you know, uh, uh, of course, you know, the average of all these two to the n probabilities, I expect to be two to the minus n, right? You know, they, 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 they sum to one, right? And so if I add up k of them, then I expect the sum to be uh, k over two to the n. Okay, so in other words, you could say, I expect to achieve a b value of b equals one, okay? Uh, now, on the other hand, what would happen if I ran this experiment with a perfect quantum computer? Okay, with no noise whatsoever. Well, then I would expect that, you know, the probability that I would sample each S sub i would really be this number here, this squared absolute value. And so now uh, I can, you know, I, I expect that I'm more likely to see the S sub i's that have, you know, larger probabilities. And so what is the, expe the expectation of the probability of a random sample that I would see? Well, this is just a calculation that I can do, right? Using the fact that my variables are exponentially distributed, uh, you end up uh, just doing uh, this integral here, integral of uh, uh, e to the minus x times x squared dx. Um, despite uh, being a computer scientist, uh, uh, even I was able to do this integral, and uh, you get two. Okay, so, so with a perfect quantum computer, you would expect to achieve a b value of two, meaning these numbers will on average be about two times uh, 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 two to the minus n. If I sum up k to them, I expect about two k over two to the n, okay? Uh, now the, the goal when you actually do the experiment is going to be to achieve some b value that is bounded above one, okay? So you won't, you probably won't achieve two, and the reason why not is that your a, a real experiment is is noisy. Okay, so you're not really sampling from that distribution d sub c that I talked about before. Uh, really, you're sampling from uh, well some noisy distribution. Um, but uh, um, we could uh, um, 
we can imagine uh, 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 heuristically that the distribution that's being sampled looks like uh, a little bit of the ideal distribution that we want plus a lot of the uniform distribution. Okay, that's a, a decent you know, heuristic model for what's going on. Here, epsilon is a number called the fidelity, and we would expect that it would decrease uh, exponentially with the depth of our circuit. Okay, uh, you know, this, by the way, this is why quantum error correction is of such massive importance, right? Until you have error correction, uh, your signal will go down exponentially with the circuit depth. Uh, but now, you know, let me let me put some actual numbers into this discussion. Okay, so uh, uh, Google, uh, as uh, as we all know, uh, you know, last this past fall uh, reported, uh, you know, the first uh, uh, experiment to, uh, that was claimed to achieve uh, quantum supremacy using a programmable uh, quantum computer. So, uh, you know, a a uh, um, a clear advantage over uh, uh, any existing classical computer, you know, running any currently known algorithm uh, for some artificial but well-defined task. Okay, that, that's sort of what we mean by, by the phrase quantum supremacy, which uh, John Preskill uh, coined uh, uh, eight years ago. Um, and the way that they did this was that they built a, a chip called Sycamore. Um, uh, so it's a superconducting chip. Uh, it has about, uh, well, it has 53 qubits on it. If you're wondering why 53, that's uh, kind of a strange number. Well, they built 54, uh, but then one of them didn't work. Okay, so, uh, so they have this 53 qubit chip. Uh, I'm not gonna draw 53 little circles. You'll get the idea. Okay, and uh, uh, they're, they're arranged in a, a roughly rectangular two-dimensional grid. And uh, we have controllable nearest neighbor coupling. So between each horizontally or adjacent, you know, horizontally or vertically adjacent pair of qubits, we can, we can uh, using control signals, we can tell it which uh, two qubit gate we would like it to do when. Okay, and uh, um, you know, these, so, the, so the chip is placed in a dilution refrigerator. It's cooled to about uh, 10 millikelvin, so about a hundredth of a degree above absolute zero. Uh, that's what makes it superconduct. That's what makes the qubits behave as qubits, at least for a very short time. Uh, for you know, uh, uh, they maintain some quantum coherence on a scale of about a time scale of about tens of microseconds. Uh, so that's not very long. But the good news is that it's long enough to uh, get in their in Google's hardest experiments to get in about 20 layers of quantum gates. Okay, so, so they're able to uh, get in a number of uh, layers of gates that is large compared to the diameter of the circuit, which is only seven or eight. Okay, that's important because that's what allows sort of mixing behavior to happen. That's what justifies the assumption that our final state uh, really should look like a, you know, a roughly like a hard random state and that the probabilities should, should indeed look like exponentially distributed random variables. Okay, so then, um, 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 you know, we, we use a, a, a classical supercomputer to, uh, you know, calculate the probabilities for the samples that we see. So how many samples do we get? Well, each, the good news is that each sample, uh, once a circuit is loaded onto the chip, takes only, um, um, a few tens of microseconds uh, to produce. So we can run uh, the same circuit over and over, and in the space of a few minutes, we can get a several million independent samples. Okay, so K, so think of K as being about five million, okay? And uh, each of these strings, S sub I, is a 53-bit string, so it's an element of this set here, okay? So now, uh, what was the result when uh, Google built this device and did this experiment? Well, um, the result uh, was that uh, they, they uh, say that they measured a fidelity epsilon that was about 0 0.002, which corresponds to uh, 
passing that linear cross entropy test uh, that I told you about before with a B value that was about 1.002. Okay, remember I said a, uh, a, a, a trivial classical algorithm could get B equals one. A perfect quantum computer we hope would get B equals two. Okay, so this is what we get. So, you know, that doesn't sound very good. That sounds barely distinguishable from the classical value of, of one. Okay, but you should really think about this like the first experiment that violated the Bell inequality, right? This really is just the computational version of, uh, of violating the Bell inequality, if you like, right? It's, you know, uh, an experiment that you do just because you're trying to prove that, uh, uh, you know, nature and your device really are quantum mechanical in the relevant sense, okay? And for that purpose, all that really matters is can you show that uh, uh, your system violates an inequality that we would expect any classical system to satisfy, right? So in the case of a Bell experiment, that would be the Bell inequality. Uh, in the case of uh, the quantum supremacy experiment, that would be the inequality B is at most one which you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have to come back to, is that really a justified assumption? Do we really believe that, that any classical algorithm will, will, will satisfy this inequality, okay? But if you believe uh, that that's the case, well then it's enough to prove that when you do the experiment, you get a B value that is bounded above one, okay? And uh, you know, remember I said that Google took millions of samples, okay? So, so typically, if my fidelity is epsilon, the number of samples K that I'm going to need to take in such an experiment, just by standard statistics, is going to scale like roughly one over epsilon squared. Okay, so epsilon is like one over 500, and you know, and, and they do indeed have a K that is large enough that they can statistically verify that this B is, uh, you know, is, is larger than what. I don't remember how many sigmas, okay? Um, now, uh, um, uh, let's see. So, so, so okay, so now, uh, now, now we sort of come to, uh, you know, a, a, a last uh, but really, really crucial question, which is, uh, uh, well, as I alluded to before, you know, what is the justification for assuming that if we have a classical uh, computer, that is trying to spoof the behavior of our quantum computer, then you know why won't it be able to spoof, right? I mean, uh, you know, uh, maybe there is a, a clever classical algorithm that could achieve some B value, like you know, 1.1 or something, right? It, it could uh, uh, find some samples that are a little bit correlated with what the quantum mechanical samples are supposed to be. Uh, um, you know, it wouldn't have to be a general purpose simulator of quantum mechanics. It would just have to spoof this one particular test that, that we're applying, right? This, this linear cross entropy test. Uh, and uh, so, um, well, you know, uh, uh, you know, of course, you know, we're not going to prove that, that there isn't such an algorithm, right? I mean, because in, in theoretical computer science, we don't even know how to prove statements like T is different from T space, right? You know, so, you know, there, there's sort of no hope in the present state of complexity theory of proving that, uh, that our test cannot be spoofed by any efficient classical algorithm, okay? But what we were able to do was to sort of give, a, give some reduction arguments, some uh, hardness arguments that uh, sort of uh, indicate that, well, well, if you can spoof the test, you know, it's not because there is something that is really especially easy about spoofing this test. It is just because the general problem of simulating a random quantum circuit is a lot easier than we, than we thought it was for a classical computer. Okay, so this brings me to, um, uh, so a preprint that uh, 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 a UT undergrad named uh, Sam Gunn and I uh, put out uh, uh, this past fall. And this was uh, uh, building on uh, earlier work by uh, me and uh, Luigi Chen uh, from uh, um, 
2017. And uh, so what we did is we said, um, suppose that there existed a polynomial time uh, classical algorithm to spoof this uh, uh, Google's linear cross entropy benchmark that, you know, summing up the probabilities test, meaning to produce, you know, a B value that is, say, bounded above one. Uh, 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 you know, and, and, and in fact, this will even work for saying, you know, even, even if we, even if the spoofing method could only achieve uh, like a, a, a one plus uh, a, B, a B value of uh, um, a one plus, um, I don't know, uh, um, 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 two thirds to the N or something like that. Okay, this, this argument would still apply. Okay, we say then there would also be, there's also a poly time classical algorithm to estimate uh, particular final amplitudes in given a, a, a random quantum circuit. So, uh, so if, if someone hands you a random quantum circuit C and they pick some output string X and they say, you know, now estimate the uh, final amplitude of X, uh, you can do, well, a little bit better than chance at that task. Not much better. In fact, uh, the advantage that, you'll, that we get over chance is an exponentially small advantage. Okay, but the advantage uh, uh, we have that we get over chance has the form of like two to the minus n, whereas all the actual algorithms uh, that we know, all the fast classical algorithms that we actually know for trying to spoof a quantum supremacy experiment, uh, uh, a general one like this, get an advantage over uh, random chance that only scales like x to the minus m, where m is the number of gates in the circuit, and which would typically be much larger than, than n, which is the number of qubits. Okay, so uh, so uh, so 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 just to complete what I was saying, uh, uh, a spoofing algorithm would imply uh, an estimating whether you know uh, uh, estimating a given amplitude uh, uh, algorithm with an advantage over the trivial estimator uh, that would have the form exponential in minus n. Uh, whereas the best that we know how to do is exponential and minus n. Okay, and if you believe that this is about the, the best you're going to do in polynomial time, then it would follow that you're not going to efficiently spoof this benchmark. Okay, so so of course this brings us to the more general question of well, how hard is it to uh, you know simulate a random quantum circuit using a classical computer? Right, so that's an extremely broad question. Uh, uh, but, uh, um, you know, I, I think it, it is only starting to be really, really studied with the uh, sustained attention that it, that it deserves. Uh, so, you know, in, intuitively, uh, you know, you could say if I have only polynomial time, it should be pretty hopeless because each final amplitude is a sum of exponentially many contributions. In fact, uh, you know, if I do like a Feynman Sum, sum over histories, then each final amplitude is a sum over a number of contributions that scales exponentially with the number of gates in my circuit. Uh, so, you know, in the case of Google's experiment, that would be like two to the thousandth power, like, you know, just even on the biggest supercomputers that exist, just forget about it. Um, uh, uh, and, you know, so, so I need, you know, I'm gonna have to do something cleverer, right? if I want uh, uh, to simulate a random quantum circuit, right? Something other than just, you know, try to look at these interference, you know, patterns among two to the 1,000 contributions to each amplitude and see whether, you know, for the specific amplitude that I care about, did the uh, interference happen more, a little bit more perfectly than average or a little bit less perfectly than average, right? I mean, phrased that way, the problem seems pretty hopeless. Uh, but uh, you know there has been some progress. Uh, 
uh, we now know, thanks to you know beautiful recent work by uh, by by Aram Harrow uh, and uh, uh, Rolando Laplaca and and others, that uh, uh, you know there is there is some advantage that you can get in uh, the quantum circuits of small depth, like constant depth ones, uh, and uh, in a, in a different kind of way. Uh, a very nice recent paper by Boaz Barak and uh, uh, two of his collaborators has uh, has also shown that uh, you know, there is some non-trivial spoofing that you can do for constant depth quantum circuits, but uh, you know, none of this has yet affected the kind of depth that we saw uh, in, in the Google experiment. Okay, so this is sort of the underlying computational problem. You know, what, what gave us a, a, a leg up, what sort of made it possible to even hope that you know, in this sort of silly sampling way that we could solve a classically hard computational problem at all, uh, was this um, exponentially distributed uh, behavior of you know the the output probabilities in a in a sorry in a in a in a, in a random quantum circuit uh, uh, this behavior um, uh, which uh, which which in turn uh, traces back to uh, uh, Wooters's observation which in turn uh, traces back to Archimedes at box theorem in 200 BC. Okay, so that's most of what I wanted to tell you today. Let me just mention, you know, a few of the the uh, the exciting open problems here. Um, so, uh, uh, sorry, let me uh, uh, draw. Um, okay, so the most obvious open problem here would be better evidence. You know, can we give better complexity theoretic evidence? For the the hardness of simulating uh, this 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 experiment uh, uh, classically, uh, you know, our, ours is based on a very strong hardness assumption. Because you know, what, we, what we'd really like to be able to say is that, like, if you could simulate this experiment quickly with your classical computer, then the polynomial hierarchy would collapse, or something really dramatic like that. But we don't seem to have the technology uh, to prove such a thing right now. Um, and then the second problem, the one that I view as maybe the most urgent theoretical open problem in this entire area uh, is, um, can we do a quantum supremacy experiment with a near-term device? Uh, uh, so, so, you know, by that I mean like a noisy quantum computer with, let's say, 50 to 300 or so qubits and without error correction. So you know, limited in depth. Can we do such a quantum computation, but in a way where there's a fast classical algorithm to verify the result? Okay. Uh, so um, I think that the central drawback of the type of experiment that Google did is that verifying that they really did the, the claim task and that they really solved the classically hard problem you know, itself took exp takes exponential time for a classical computer, right? Which means they could just barely do this with 50 or so qubits. In fact, with 53 qubits, they didn't even directly verify. Uh, it, was too, it was already too hard. They just uh, extrapolated from slightly easier cases, okay? But, you know, with 53 qubits, there is, um, especially now, there's uh, work from groups at IBM and Alibaba it says that if you use the largest supercomputers that now exist on Earth, it should take you merely a few days to simulate uh, uh, what Google did in a few minutes with its Sycamore chip. Okay, so you know, so you're, so yeah, you know, the biggest classical computers in the world can not quite, but you know, almost keep up with the with the quantum computer. So it is a little bit of a cat and mouse game, right? Classical computers will of course get better. Well, you know, the, the quantum computing hardware will also get better. Unfortunately, this cat and mouse game, you know, uh, nature is sort of inherent to the task in question because, like, you can't run this kind of experiment with 100 qubits because, well, you know, you could, but if you did, then we wouldn't even know how to verify the result in any feasible way. Okay, so can you sort of encode some secret into your random quantum circuit that makes the answer easy to verify with a classical computer? I think that that is maybe the most important open problem. 
Um, and then, okay, alongside better evidence for hardness, I should have said also, uh, you know, of course, it is the field is wide open for anyone to refute a claim of quantum supremacy by actually finding fast classical algorithms to simulate random quantum circuits. And then the final question would be, uh, well, what is any of this good for? You know, I mean, it's good for, I mean, for me, I like to say that the number one application of a quantum computer has always just been to disprove the people who said that quantum computing would never work. You know, the people like, like Gil Kalai and uh, Leonid Levitt and so forth. And, you know, I think that it's, it's, it's had a lot, you know, it's, it's had a striking recent success at, at, at precisely that. But, you know, is this experiment by itself, is it useful for anything else? You know, the first guess would be no. Um, a couple of years ago, I came up with a new proposal, which was that, you know, you could actually repurpose these experiments to generate random bits in a way that would have some amount of cryptographic security. That is, you know, if you have verified that the quantum computer is solving a hard problem, then under some further computational assumptions, you've also verified that even a quantum computer could have only generated these strings by sampling them from a distribution that has a lot of entropy. Okay, and so then you, what you can get is like a public randomness beacon where everybody trusts that these bits are really random and they could not have been spoofed by secretly deterministic bits. And that in turn could have uh, a bunch of applications, for example, to uh, what are called proof of stake cryptocurrencies, which are uh, environmentally friendlier alternatives to Bitcoin. Okay, but you know, to really make this practical, I think you're gonna, we're going to need to make progress on this problem, the verification problem. How do we do these kind of quantum supremacy experiments with this sort of, uh, uh, you know, these, these little bumps away from uniformity, but do it in a way where it's also easy with a classical computer to verify the answer. Okay, so uh, thanks everyone for listening, and I'm very happy to take questions. Well, thank you very much for a beautiful and inspiring talk. I'm sure there are lots of questions. You can press so, your space bar to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, did, did, did people already ask questions by text? Should I be looking at those? No, not yet. Oh, okay. Hey, Somebody so, uh, I, do, I do see one question, which was, is the non-uniformity in the samples the result of not sampling from the full two to the n space? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, so, you know, typically the distribution that you get will have support on every element of zero, one to the n, right? So every possible n bit string will have a non zero probability. The non uniformity is really a result of quantum interference, right? It's a result of quantum interference happening a little, uh, happening a little bit more perfectly. Uh, for some of the uh, out possible output strings than it does for others. Or to say the same thing in another way, the non-uniformity is a result of the fact that it is as if we were sampling a random point from the two to the n dimensional unit sphere. Or not exactly, but you know, it is for uh, practical purposes, it is, it is as though we were. And as we said, a, a, uniform, a uniform random point uh, from a high dimensional sphere looks like a bunch of independent Gaussian random variables. And, you know, Gaussians, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, have, have bumps in them. So, you know, they have, uh, they attain uh, uh, larger and smaller values, which is what we wanted. Hi, Scott, it's Mark Kahn. Uh, can I ask you a quick question? Of course. Uh, so, so here, I mean, the, the, the gut reaction is basically initially, well, you're just showing you've got a certain probability distribution. It's a very abstract problem, non-concrete problem to solve. But on the other hand, you actually are computing numbers, right? You're computing mm -hmm. a probability that can be verified on iteration of the experiment mm -hmm. so that you actually are getting numbers, right, mm -hmm. that cannot be computed in a way that's classical, correct? Is that well, it, it's important to say this carefully. The output of the quantum supremacy experiment is just a collection of samples, okay? So, you know, it's not estimates of the probabilities. If I wanted to actually estimate the probability of a specific output string, you know, I could do that with a quantum computer, but typically I would need exponentially many samples because, you know, these probabilities are all exponentially small numbers, right? I don't expect to see the same output more than once. 
Okay, so the output of my quantum supremacy experiment is just a collection of k samples. Okay, can, just, can I can I turn that question into a positive yes. one? Is yes, there sure. a way of turning this into a way of computing a number conceptually, or is it impossible, difficult? That, that okay, that that is a superb question, and that is in some sense that's based basically another way of asking my, my second open problem. What I, you know, well, you know, if, if, if we could do, do what you said, if we could give a, you know, a, a way to uh, sort of use this experiment to estimate a specific number, then in particular, that would provide an answer to my second open problem, right? That would give a, a or, that, that, or, 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 or at least it would help us enormously in, in, in answering that, that problem, okay? Now, uh, you know, the, you know, if we go back to the very beginnings of quantum computing, right, the whole uh, uh, virtue of Shor's algorithm, for example, is that, you know, at the end, you know, whatever it's doing in the middle, at the end of the day, it just outputs a number, right, which is, you know, the, it outputs a factor of, of your number, of, of your composite number, and, you know, and, and, and you don't have to believe uh, anything about how the quantum computer works, because it's easy to verify that number yourself. Right, uh, you know, factoring is an NP problem, as we, you know, as we would say in uh, uh, computer science. Um, uh, the trouble is, you know, with uh, these noisy near-term quantum computers, we don't know at present how to do anything of that character. Okay, we we know so so we know, you know, like noisy near-term quantum computations that we can do that you know, seem to exceed the ability of a classical computer to simulate, but they are inherently sampling based, like what I was talking about before, okay? And then, in addition, we know how to do quantum computations that would return a definite right answer that we could verify and that we don't know how to produce with a classical computer, as with Shor's algorithm, for example. But all of those things seem to require a huge amount of error correction, okay? And so then, you know, once you in, uh, incorporate the error correction, then you would be talking about literally millions of physical qubits using the known error correction, error correction scheme. And that's why, you know, no one, no one has done it yet. And, uh, you know, and probably it's not happening in the near future. Okay. So, uh, so, so a candidate, and I, I'm going to finish with this, a candidate, yes. a candidate number would be a sum over a lot of probabilities that would end up giving you something non-trivial. Right. But that sum cannot be, it's too hard to compute without error correction, right? The, the, uh, in, in some sense, the, the, the issue is this. If, if, if it's just one of the probabilities or just a sum of a few of them, then, uh, you know, it, uh, uh, it, it's really hard to compute with a classical computer. And also, the quantum computer will not give a good estimator because the number will be too small, right? Now, on the other hand, if we took a sum of many, many of the probabilities, like in, you know, an exponentially large set of them, like two to the n minus one of them, well, that now um, our quantum computer can estimate it. But the trouble is that now a classical computer could also estimate it, just because now it's just concentration of measure, right? Now the sum will just you know, be extremely well concentrated about some easy to predict value, right? So, you know, to actually get out a specific number that you couldn't have computed without the quantum computer, but you can easily verify it with the classical computer, and you can do all of this on a noisy near-term device, you know, there's a reason why I am stressing this as sort of the biggest theoretical challenge for this field right now, to figure out how to do that. Thanks. You're welcome. Hi, Scott. Hi. Hi, this is Shun. Hi, hi, good to see you. Hi, uh, so thank you for your nice talk. Um, I have a question about the threshold of the value of B. Yes. Uh, you, you wrote down the two over three to the power N, is that? Oh, uh, the, okay, so, so the actual value of the threshold, I think, let me, okay, I'm, I'm trying to remember. Um, I think I think I think it would work for for any c to the minus n. Is that right? I mean, yeah. I mean, the 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 advantage over uh, guessing that I, that that I know is achievable has the form of like c to the minus m, where m is the number of gates. Oh, so uh, you mean uh, quantum computer seems uh, it can achieve e 
e to the power minus o n, uh -huh. but classical so, computer. So, so there, there, there's a little bit of a subtlety here, depending uh -huh. on you know our, our, our the nature of our classical spoofing algorithm, whether it has to be efficient always or only efficient on expectation. Okay, because if we said that it only has to be efficient on expectation, uh, in, in expectation, then you could imagine a spoofing algorithm that just normally does nothing, does something trivial, but one time in two to the n, it will run a full brute force simulation, right? Mm -hmm. Now, such a classical spoofing algorithm will get a two to the minus n advantage over, you know, uh, uh, the, the trivial estimator, right? But it'll do it in a kind of a stupid way, right? Uh, so, so, so if you allow that kind of thing, then yeah, you could get a two to the minus n advantage, Otherwise, as far as I know, you know, I think we only know how to get a, an exponential of minus m advantage. Certainly, for high depth quantum circuits, we don't know of any way that would get like a one over polynomial in n advantage, which is where I would start calling it a noticeable advantage as a, as a complexity theory. So, so uh, m is uh, the number of gates? m is the number of gates, yes. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm, sure, no problem. Um, Are there any other questions? Go ahead. Well, if there are no other questions, I want to thank you again, Scott, for a really wonderful talk. And oh. I look forward to your coming back again or having more interaction. Of course, of course. I, I look forward to able to travel again and certainly Boston would be one of my first trips. All right. Thanks so much for listening. All right. All right. I guess I'll stop the screen sharing then. Right. Okay. All right. Um, so thanks a lot. Bye -bye. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. Have a good day.